This week we're learning Parsha Vayeshev, and he sat down, as to, meaning as to rest. First, the content. Jacob settles in Hebron with his 12 sons. His favorite is 17 years old Joseph. And um, Joseph keeps on telling his father everything about the brothers, whatever they do wrong, and uh, he is basically like, acting like an informer, uh, which is a, an issue for the brothers, and they don't like him for that. More than that, his brothers are jealous of him because he gets preferential treatment from, um, from um, Jacob, from Jacob which is a very good Torah message for every parent. Never, ever give preferential treatment to one of your children as comparing to the others, because that creates jealousy and many, many problems in the future. So Yaakov or Jacob basically even creates a multicolored special code for, uh, for Joseph. Now, Joseph, on top of everything else, Joseph even uh, relates to his brothers and to his father his two dreams, which he foretells that he is destined to rule over them, increasing their envy even further and hatred toward, towards him. Uh, when Joseph uh, is sent by Yaakov to check out on his brothers in the desert where they were... Um, shepherding the flock, um, he appears in the desert and Shimon and Levi plot to kill him. But Reuben suggests that they throw him into the pit, which was a dry pit uh, with snakes and scorpion instead. Um, uh, however, he is intending to come back later and to save him. Well, that doesn't happen. So while Joseph is in the pit, Judah arranges with the with, um, uh, passing Ishmaelites to sell Joseph uh, into slavery. It's a caravan of Ishmaelites passing by, and uh, Judah is using the opportunity to make some money by selling his brother into slavery. The brothers dip Joseph's special coat, which they took off from him, in, in the blood before they put him in the pit. Yeah. And so they dip this coat into the blood of a goat and show it to their father when they come back, leading him to believe that his most beloved son was devoured by a wild beast. Um, now, and at this moment, basically, Torah stops telling us this story and switches to another narrative, to another story about Judah himself. He marries and has three children. The eldest is Er, and he dies young and childless. His wife Tamar is given in liberate marriage to the second son, Anan. Liberate marriage is when a couple doesn't have any children and the husband dies. The wife must marry the younger brother in order to produce a child in his memory. However, Anan sins by spilling his seed, so because he doesn't want Tamar to get pregnant, and as a punishment from Hashem, he meets the same early death as his brother. Judah is reluctant to have his third son uh, to marry Tamar, because he believes she is a wicked woman, and um, but Tamar is determined to have a child from Judah's family. So Tamar does the following. She disguises herself as a prostitute and seduces Judah himself. So Judah hears eventually after three, four months that his daughter-in-law has become pregnant. So he orders her to be executed for harlotry, for prostitution, basically. But when Tamar produces some personal effects, he left with her his stuff and his ring, um, he left them with her for a uh, pledge for payment. Uh, he has got no choice, but he publicly admits that he is the father of the um, unborn child. Tamar gives birth to twin sons, 
actually parents, who is the ancestor of none less than King David, and Zerah, the second child. And then the story switches back to Joseph. He is taken to Egypt and sold to Potiphar, the minister in charge of Pharaoh's slaughterhouses. God blesses everything Joseph does in service to Potiphar. And very quickly he becomes an overseer of all his master's property. So he controls everything in Potiphar's possession. Potiphar's wife desires this young, handsome and very smart and charismatic man. And when Joseph rejects her advances... She tells her husband that the Hebrew slave was trying to force himself on her, to rape her. And she, and as a result, he finishes up in prison. So Joseph in prison now, and, but he gains trust and admiration of the prison guards and the jailers in there. And very quickly they appoint him in a position of authority in the prison administration. So, in prison, Joseph meets Pharaoh's chief butler and chief baker. Both were imprisoned and incarcerated for offending somehow the royal master. They did something wrong. So, and both of them have disturbing dreams, which Joseph interprets both of the, the dreams for both of them. And in three days, he tells them that the butler will be, will be released and the baker will be hanged. Uh, and that is exactly what happens. Joseph asks the butler to intercede on his behalf with the Pharaoh. However, despite the fact that Joseph's predictions are fulfilled, the butler forgets about him and does nothing for him. So Joseph remains in jail as we will learn later on, for another two years. And that's the end of this parsha. Now, from this parsha, Vayeshev, and onwards, Torah relates to us Joseph's trials and tribulations, and his ultimate ascendancy in the next parsha, Miketz, to the post of Viceroy of Egypt. So, Joseph's story is always read around the time of Hanukkah, which Hanukkah starts this Thursday evening. So, this, this is, of course, it's not a coincidence. It's not a happenstance. Nothing in Torah happens just accidentally. There are deep connections between Joseph's life, Joseph's challenges, and those faced by Maccabees which what we celebrate, the victory of Maccabees at Han Hanukkah. Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik Zettel, who passed in 1993, and he was known as the Rav, formulated this thought in the following manner. There is meaning and symbolism to every detail of Jewish calendar. The mere fact that Hanukkah always falls on either or both of the two Shabbats devoted to reading of, the, of Joseph's story, Vayeshev and Miketz, highlights to us that there is a link between the events surrounding Joseph's sale into slavery and the events leading to Hanukkah, which took place quite a few hundred years later. Um, the Joseph story contains elements of Maccabees' dramatic struggle with the Hellenistic tyranny of Syria. Rabbi Soloveitchik notes that Joseph's overall task was very similar in kind to that of his father Jacob, since Joseph, like his father, had to prove that Abraham's covenant with Hashem could be practiced outside the promised land, that the moral laws are not really contingent or dependent upon geography or chronology or surrounding environment. According to Rav Soloveitchik, however, 
there are two essential differences between the tasks that confronted Yaakov and um, Joseph. First, Yaakov had to prove that Torah is re realizable in poverty and oppression. Why? Because he, uh, he was serving uh, in an agricultural society. He was a shepherd uh, for Laban. Whereas Joseph's mission was to demonstrate enormous success, unlimited riches, admiration, prominence and, prominence and power. And even those are not in conflict with spiritual covenantal life. As I said, Jacob's life um, of spiritual and religious heroism was in a backward pastoral society, agricultural society, under domination of Laban. And Joseph was, who possessed enormous power in Egypt, uh, he was the second in command, and he still demonstrated his heroic and spiritual approach to life in the most advanced civilization of the time of antiquity, Egypt. To relate that to the Hashmanaims, to, to the Maccabees, um, a careful reading of Joseph's story reveals that his drama is very similar. It is a story of a young Jewish man who, despite all trials and tribulations befalling him, he, he was a slave, he was finished up in jail, he had these advances from this woman, uh, you know, all sorts of problems, right? But he still managed to carry the banner of Kedusha, holiness, under the most trying circumstances. Because Potiphar, you know, the wife of Potiphar was, was a very beautiful woman. There's a lot of uh, issues there. Upon due reflection, this were precisely the task undertaken by the Maccabees. As stated in our prayer that sages um, call al Hanisim, prayer for Hanukkah. And this is what the prayer says. In the days, in the days of Metatiahu, the son of Yohanan, the high priest, the Hashmanains and his Hashmanain and his sons, when the wicked Hellenic government rose up against your people Israel to make them forget your Torah and violate the decrees of your will. But you in your abounding mercy stood by them in the time of their distress. They are referring to Hashem. You waged their battles, defended their rights, and avenged the wrong done to them. You delivered the mighty into the hands of the weak, the many into the hands of few, the impure into the hands of pure, the wicked into the hands of the righteous, and the wanton sinners into the hands of those who occupy themselves with your Torah. You made a great and holy name for yourself and your world, and affected a great deliverance and redemption for your people Israel for this very day. Then your children entered the shrine of your house, cleansed your temple, purified your sanctuary, kindled lights in your holy courtyards, and instituted these eight days of Hanukkah to give thanks and praise to your great name. And that is the prayer for Hanukkah. Rav Soloveitchik asks a question that is fundamental to understanding the true role of Maccabees and their relationship to Joseph in his spiritual, as his spiritual heirs. How did the Almighty use the Hashmanaeans in order to save the covenantal community? He required of the Hashmanaeans a total involvement, physical participation. He wanted them to fight. You know, the, the, he required their sacrificial action, heroic, heroic decisions, and courageous plans, as he demanded them from Joseph as well. Exactly the same. Rav Salavitchik's powerful response brings us to this understanding of Joseph and Hanukkah parallel as never before. The Hashmanis seize the initiative. God willed them to defend the sanctuary, to guard the honor of the Jewish women, because the whole story started 
from the need of the Greeks, which they insinuated a law, that they will sleep with the every new bride. The pride of the people and the grandeur of the Torah the Hashmanians were defending. They fought like lions, selflessly, and with the unqualified devotion. Of course, God defeated the enemy after men did their part. The Hashmanians were confronted by the same destiny as Joseph, the destiny of suffering. Joseph suffered, they suffered. Joseph was fighting for Kiddusha all the time and managed to maintain it. It is, the, and Hashmanians obviously did so too. It is a great and heroic destiny, but an exceedingly difficult one. In many ways, Stories of Joseph and Maccabees serve us today as a blueprint for living in this primisianic age which we live in. Uh, whether it's for Israel or diaspora, when we too are called upon to guard the pride of our people and the grandeur of our Torah. In our time of religious freedom of expression, when we have got no limitations, atheism and strong influences of the secular world on the whole religious world. It is very easy to forget who we are and what is our purpose and why are we here on this planet. But with Hashem's help and our fervent, strong devotion, may we ever have the strength and vision to remember Hashem and the importance of the Torah study. Shabbat Shalom. <laughs>